Okay, uh, hello again, and uh, welcome to those of you who just joined. Uh, seems like uh, everyone who was waiting uh, have been able to connect now, so I think it's time to get started. So uh, again, very warm, warm welcome to the uh, Carmental Stockholm office uh, for today's webinar, where the main focus will be for us to go through some of the new features that have recently been added to our uh, geospatial SDK Carmenta engine. Uh, and you'll also get a little bit of a sneak peek on some of the functionality that we are currently in the process of implementing and that will be released in the upcoming uh, releases here. So I uh, hope you can all see my screen properly. Uh, just for those of you who are new to Carmenta, a quick introduction. My name is Tobias Moberg. I'm uh, the head of product management at Carmenta. So I'm uh, overall responsible for the product suite that we provide. Uh, and also, of course, uh, uh, responsible for its roadmap. Uh, and uh, I spend a lot of time talking to customers like you to try to figure out what's important for you, uh, what should be our priorities ahead for adding new functionality to the toolkit. Uh, so, of course, um, if any of what I described today uh, sounds interesting, then feel free to reach out uh, afterwards so that we can continue the discussion and ensure that we take uh, your requirements into account. Um, briefly on the agenda for the webinar, uh, I'll start by giving you a brief introduction to Carmenta's geospatial technology. It won't take long, but since I see we have a few new people on the call, uh, I think it might be a good idea to just uh, overall give you a, um, a view of what our product suite is and the different products and what they can do. But quite quickly, we will jump into the main item on the agenda, then, which is to go through the new features that we added in Carmenta Engine 5.15. Uh, our most recent release of the SDK. Uh, after we've gone through that with the plenty of hands-on look at the, uh, at the new features, we will uh, look ahead a little bit. Uh, we will look at uh, a few of the features that are on the roadmap for Camenta Engine. Finally, uh, I'll wrap up this session uh, by uh, doing a little Q&A session. And uh, here's something where you can actually uh, contribute a little bit. Uh, there is a UI in Zoom uh, for questions and answers. Uh, there should be a button somewhere in your Zoom client saying Q&A. Uh, you can use this UI throughout the webinar to send in questions to me. So if you see me demoing something interesting, then uh, just uh, post a question there if you, have a, if you want to know more about it. And I will take a look at all those questions that have come in during this uh, Q&A session towards the end. Uh, and of course, if there are more questions than I have time to answer, then uh, I will get back to you all in an email uh, with follow-up information after the webinar. So uh, I can also mention that the webinar is being recorded. Uh, so uh, uh, we will post the webinar on our YouTube channel uh, once it's uh, completed. So you can go back and, and have a look at this information uh, later on as well. Okay, uh, so that's uh, overall what I... Um, plan to cover in the, the next 45 minutes or so. So uh, just briefly about our geospatial technology. Uh, well, I, I like to uh, summarize it like this. Carmenta is all about creating technology that help you visualize and analyze geospatial information. And when we talk about geospatial information, we're not only talking about maps. We're not only talking about the static background data that goes into a geospatial application. We're also talking about all the dynamic information, the application information that you need to display on top of this map, such as uh, localized units, uh, a tactical scenario with the uh, symbols and lines and the areas and stuff, uh, maybe a georeferenced video feed downlinked from a drone or uh, live uh, plots or radar video coming in from a radar installation. All those kind of dynamic data sources that need to be displayed on top of the map is also part of what we handle with our SDK. And we try to do that as efficiently as possible to ensure that you have a really high performance and interactive map display in your application. It's also not only about visualizing this data, although that is a big part of what we do. Um, we are also very good at performing various kinds of analysis to help your end users understand what's going on in the map. Uh, say, for example, our visibility analysis. It can help you quickly figure out whether you have a line of sight to a certain point in the terrain, or for that matter, which areas would be the best to place an observer to look at a certain area in the terrain, as we will see an example of later in this webinar. 
Uh, or if you're doing a planning uh, in a ground scenario where you have an off-road vehicle, then we can help you figure out how that off-road vehicle can traverse the terrain, uh, given the terrain types and the slopes uh, and so on. And those are just two examples. There are many uh, different types of analyses that are part of the toolkit and that can, as I said, help you figure out what's going on in the map. We focus very much on what we call the mission critical use case with our technology. And that means that we spend a lot of time verifying and testing uh, and stress testing our technology to ensure that it works well when the requirements are really high. If you have a system which is must be up and running 24-7, uh, which simply cannot crash and which simply cannot be laggy or, or uh, slow to respond, then Carmenta Engine is really your map engine of choice. Those are the kind of scenarios where we really shine with our technology. So our products then, uh, well, the core product is the Carmenta Engine. Um, I think uh, most of you on the call who are familiar with our technology, you are Carmenta Engine users. And indeed the focus of this webinar will be the new features in the engine itself. So the engine is, a so-called SDK, a software development kit. Uh, so it's something that you use as a developer to integrate mapping and geospatial functionality into your own application. Uh, it runs on both Windows, Linux, and Android. Uh, and we have support for a number of different programming languages. Uh, you can do C++ development. Uh, you can use it from .NET languages such as C Sharp. There's a Java binding. Uh, and you can even script the map engine using Python, if you wish. So it's uh, possible to integrate Carmenta Engine in a lot of different ways into your own application. But there is also another product in our product suite called the Carmenta Server. And the server is kind of an encapsulation of our core technology. So rather than providing APIs for uh, direct integration into an application, Carmenta Server provides service interfaces. It runs as a web service, uh, it can either be installed on a service machine or it can be deployed as a Docker container into a cloud. Uh, but it then provides service-based interfaces uh, to the same kind of technology that we have in the engine. And in fact, internally, Carmenta server is actually running Carmenta engine. So you have access to all the same visualization and analysis functionality. So the server can either be used to build completely web-based solution where the front end runs in a web browser using JavaScript uh, client then, uh, or it can be used as a backend for Carmenta engine-based applications, or thanks to our very good support for interoperability, you can also use it as a backend for systems using other geospatial technologies. Uh, we are a proud member of OGC, the Open Geospatial Consortium, uh, and we take pride in ensuring that the interfaces to Carmenta server uh, conforms to these open standards that enable interoperability in the geospatial domain. Okay, so those are our main products in the product suite, the engine and the server. But enough about our product, product suite on a high level. Let's dive into uh, the real topic for today's webinar, which is the new features in the engine itself. So uh, without uh, further ado, uh, the list of new features. Well, one of the big new things in the engine, uh, which you have probably seen if you follow us on social media, uh, is that we have added support for Linux on the ARM platform. Uh, Linux on ARM is sometimes uh, known as embedded Linux. Uh, typical use cases are platforms uh, such as those used in vehicles, um, maybe even uh, autonomous vehicles uh, or uh, aircrafts like drones, for example. Uh, so it's now possible to use the full functionality of Carmenta Engine on embedded platforms like that. Uh, and as I uh, noted here, the functionality is exactly the same. You might uh, recognize this picture from uh, our LinkedIn feed a few months ago here, where we <laughs> gave you a little sneak peek of this functionality, where Carmenta Engine is actually running on board a Raspberry Pi, a tiny little uh, computer based on uh, an ARM processor with a display attached here. Uh, and for those of you who are Camenta Engine users, you will uh, recognize this sample. It's one of the samples that are included in the SDK. It's the 3D globe with the 
large numbers of plots visualized using our um, hardware accelerated effects to give them like a glow. And they're moving around this, this globe here. So what this shows you is that our full 3D rendering capability, including the support for these uh, hardware accelerated shaders, is available also on Raspberry Pi. Of course, when we're running on an embedded platform like this, we will use OpenGL ES for the rendering, just like we do on Android, for example. So really, we think this opens up a lot of new opportunities for how you can integrate Carmenta Engine in various use cases. We're already seeing interest from customers, for example, in using our technology on board an autonomous ground vehicle to help the vehicle navigate in the terrain using our terrain routing. Uh, the vehicle can then do that in a completely offline way using local data sources, which gives it much more autonomy than if it has to be continuously connected to a, a server somewhere which performs the routing. So really cool new use cases we see happening thanks to the support for embedded Linux. So what else did we do in 5.15? Uh, well, another big new feature is that we now natively support meteorological data in the form of GRIB data files. So there's a new data set in the engine called the GRIB data set. Uh, it makes it possible to connect directly to these GRIB files. GRIB stands for gridded binary. It's a standard format to distribute uh, multi-dimensional uh, raster data, such as weather forecasts. Uh, and by multi-dimensional, I mean that they can also include a, for example, a time component. If you have forecasts for uh, several time slots into the future, and uh, they can include other dimensions such as elevation, for example, if you have, say, a, a cloud cover forecast that covers uh, several different ele elevations. Um, so it's a multidimensional format that can now be directly accessed in uh, Carmenta Engine. Uh, I think we can have a look at an example uh, of this, actually. Um, and by the way, uh, I should mention, don't forget the QA panel. Uh, if you want to know more about any of this functionality, then just to post a question in the QA uh, panel, and I will have a look at it later in the webinar. But for now, just a quick example of the uh, meteorological data support. And uh, what I'm doing now is I'm opening up one of the samples that are included in the 515 SDK. That's what I'll be doing throughout this webinar, by the way. So. Uh, if you think the demos look interesting, then you should really get your hands on a 515 SDK and play around yourself. Uh, and for those of you who are not current customers of our technology, uh, then uh, please note that there are evaluation versions uh, available. So uh, look at our website and request an evaluation and uh, you'll get your hands on this in no time. Right. So anyway, I opened up this sample, but actually let's start looking at it in Carmenta Studio, the uh, visual map configuration tool that's part of the SDK. Uh, so you can see this is a quite basic uh, configuration. It only has two layers. And if we look uh, to the far right here, uh, you can see that the data set used in these layers is a so-called grid data set, then, which reads uh, a specific kind of, of file here according to the, the file pattern. Um, so that's how easy it is to connect to GRIB data. Uh, you then use uh, the GRIB query to actually query this multidimensional uh, data source. So in this case, uh, we have received or, or we specify that we want to retrieve a, a certain parameter. Uh, you, Of course, when you set this up, you will look at the GRIB specification. Uh, the, the parameter 100 here is apparently the wave height because that is what we are visualizing in this layer. Uh, then, in addition, we've specified another parameter, which is the time. Uh, and as I mentioned, most forecasts will be available in several different time slots. Uh, so specifying the, the correct time slot is as easy as just setting this time property uh, on the grid query. But once you've done that, then the data set will return regular raster data, just like any other raster data source in Carmenta Engine. So you can, for example, visualize it with the raster visualizer, as we've done here, uh, three different colors. Um, and if we look at the resulting presentation in Carmenta Explorer, you'll see that, yep, this is the grid data. Uh, we get the colorization that, that we expect. Um, so that's how easy it is to bring in the forecast data into the engine. Uh, but that's actually not the only thing we did uh, with related to meteorological data. We also added two other components in 5.15. Uh, the first one is called point sample operator. And yeah, its name kind of implies what it does. Uh, it samples from a raster data source. 
and it generates uh, point features, evenly spaced uh, with a pixel distance between them, uh, where the raster value is an attribute on the point feature. So this is a um, sort of a generally useful functionality. It can make it much easier to inspect raster data sources generally, because you, you, you get these uh, point features with attributes. Uh, specifically for the meteorological visualization, it's very useful together with another new component, which is the wind barb symbol. Wind barbs, uh, those are a standardized way to visualize wind strengths uh, in a map. Uh, the direction of the little barb, it indicates which direction the wind is, is um, blowing. And then you get little um, sort of uh, lines on the barb and the number of lines uh, indicate how much uh, wind there is. Uh, that was not a very good explanation, so that, let's just have a look at the sample instead. Going back to Camantha Studio, uh, you can see that in this second layer, we're again reading the, the grid file, but we're this time passing it into a point sample operator to get these points. And the points are then visualized with a symbol visualizer that uses the wind barb symbol. So this is an example of using all these components then uh, to visualize wind. And if I enable this layer, you can see that we get this sort of presentation, which you will recognize if you're active in the aeronautical domain. Um, so uh, the type of symbol here and the number of little um, lines uh, indicate the wind strength, and you can see the direction as well. And when I zoom in and out of this map, you'll see that the distance between these wind barbs is a constant distance in pixels. And that's what the uh, point sample operator ensures them. So yeah, that's how easy it has become to work with meteorological data sets uh, directly in Kermanta Engine with these uh, new additions uh, related to meteorological uh, functionality. Okay, uh, so moving on, what else did we do in 5.15? Uh, well, we also improved our support for military tactical uh, symbology. If you're active in the military domain, uh, you will recognize these uh, symbol standard names. The MIL standard 2525 is an American uh, symbol standard that specifies the symbology for, for tactical overlays. And there is a corresponding uh, NATO standard called the AP6 standard. Uh, and what we've done in 515 is that we've completed our support for the D or Delta versions of these standards. Uh, the D is the most recent version. Uh, we're hearing a lot from our customers that uh, support for the D version standards is starting to pop up in their requirements specs. So that's why we've uh, put focus on, on uh, completing this support now. Um, so essentially, the support for the D-level standards is now at the same level as for the previous B and C-level standards. Um, so you can now move to these standards in your application without losing any sort of functionality. But of course, uh, we remain backwards compatible. We're not forcing you to upgrade to the D-level standards. You can still stay on B or C if you so choose. Um, so should we perhaps have a little look at uh, this as well? Um, I'm opening another one of the SDK samples here. This is the tactical map sample. And it's actually now in 515, it's been updated to use the D level symbology. So you can see the, the different uh, symbols, the different areas, uh, the, the uh, tactical graphics, uh, such as the uh, arrows, which are fully possible to interact with, and the uh, boundaries and so on. Uh, if I open the properties window in the Explorer, you can see that. Uh, these symbols, they are all identified using a so-called SIDC code, a symbol identifier. Um, it can be good to know if you worked with the previous versions of the standards that in the Delta version of the standard, the SIDC is now fully numerical. Uh, it used to be an alphanumeric string, which was uh, reasonably human readable. Uh, that's no longer the case. Um, this is not our fault. <laughs> it's the way that they've re redesigned the standards essentially. So the, the SIDCs are a little bit harder to parse um, um, from a human readability point of view. Uh, uh, so that's something that you will potentially have to change in your application to adapt to these new SIDC codes if you want to upgrade to the D-level standards. Um, but Carmanta Engine support is there and it's, uh, it's complete now uh, in 5.15. So you can go right ahead and, and upgrade to the D-level. Okay. 
So that's the uh, military symbology side of things. Uh, what else did we do in 515 then? Uh, well, on the analysis front, we made a quite cool improvement uh, to one of the analyses in our visibility uh, suite. And the analysis that we focused on for this release is the so-called visibility index calculation. So the visibility index, uh, it's been around for quite some time. And uh, the purpose of it is to give you an idea of how much of your surroundings you can see from certain points in the terrain. Um, so you've been able to use it to essentially analyze over a certain area of potential places where you could uh, uh, go and uh, localize your, your, your troops or whatever. Um, you can figure out that, okay, this is a good place to go to because I will have a pretty good clear view of my surroundings. That's the existing analysis. What we did in this release is that we've made it possible to specify a target area for this analysis. So rather than just analyzing how much of your surroundings you can see, Carmenta Engine can now really efficiently tell you how much of your designated target area that you can observe from a certain position. And we believe that this can be very useful uh, in operational uh, scenarios where you're, when you're deciding where to locate yourself to, to observe um, certain interesting positions, right? So uh, let's just uh, look at a little example of this as well. Opening up the Explorer again, and then uh, I'm opening the, the sample configuration for the visibility analysis. So if you're a long time uh, Carmenta engine user, you will recognize this sample area here. It's Lake Tahoe in Northern California. We use a, a lot of uh, sample data sources from there. So that's where you can usually play around with our analyses. <laughs> So uh, with it, we're at the southern shore of Lake Tahoe here. You can see it's a quite mountainous area. Good place for figuring out the intervisibility of things. Uh, so where should we start? Well, uh, let's start by defining a target area then, because this is what's new in this release, right? So I'm adding a little polygon here, and then I can, of course, edit that, uh, define a suitable area here. We say that this is the area that we want to observe in this mission. Um, and then, of course, the other input to the analysis is the possible observation areas. So that's the other area I have to define here. So say, for example, that, yes, uh, we're approaching from this side. So we think that uh, this area over here uh, is maybe a, these are the, the possible areas where we could approach and try to, to look at uh, this target area, right? Okay. So once we've defined these two areas, we can now... Uh, quite easily start this analysis. So uh, what I did now, the layer I enabled is the output from the visibility index operator. So the coloring you see here, and also these ESO lines with labels, it tells you approximately how many percent of the target area that you can see from certain points in the terrain here. So interestingly, it turns out that these hills over here are not really a good point at all to observe this target area. It would be much uh, more practical to move over to this area, because here I have a much better visibility. And as you can see, when I start to interact with this polygon and when I start to interact with the target area, the analysis is recalculated instantly. Um, so I can now see, for example, that moving up here and getting up onto those hills over here, that's the best way to observe the target area. I, I see well over half of the target area from, from uh, up here, for example. So that's a little example of the improved visibility index uh, calculation. And uh, we can't wait to see how you utilize this analysis uh, as part of your applications that you're building with the end. And uh, maybe I should add that, of course, all the analyses that we provide, they are not only designed to be used in a visual context like this, of course, that's the best way to demo them for me is to just display a map and interact with the map and show how the analysis changes. Uh, but you can just as well in your application trigger this kind of analysis in a backend process and use it to influence your other calculations. Um, so the analyses are all available both for a visual um, use like this directly in a map layer and for backend calculations. That's important to remember. Okay, 
So that's the improved visibility index. Uh, but that's not all. Uh, we did other things as well in 5.15, moving on. Uh, yeah, another cool thing is, is that we've added support for the map engine for reading all kinds of data. Uh, so map files, configuration files, resource files, what have you. Uh, you can read this now, not only from the file system, but also directly from zip archives. Uh, and you can read from zip archives without having to first decompress the data. It's pretty cool. Um, I won't give you so much of an example. What I'll do instead is I, we will take a quick look at the documentation for, for this so that you know where to dig into this uh, yourself later on. So this is the um, Endian SDK documentation. Uh, and I've uh, opened the uh, page for what we call virtual paths. So this is actually on a technical level, the new feature in uh, 5.15. Almost everywhere where you can specify a path and or a file name, you can now also specify two other uh, sort of uh, resource locators. Firstly, uh, you can specify a name that starts with the zip colon prefix. And this is how you reference data inside zip archives. Uh, so it's a, a really easy syntax. It's very easy to tell the engine to go and look for data inside a zip archive instead. And when we did this, we actually also added support for standard uh, base64 encoded data using the data, the standardized data colon prefix. Um, so say, for example, that you have a PNG file, uh, some symbol of some sort, and you want to embed that directly into your map configuration file, you can now simply base64 encode it and then put it into the, the file name property of your uh, raster symbol as a data colon formatted string. That's pretty cool. Uh, I can uh, simplify your, your packaging of symbols and stuff quite a lot, I think. Um, but yeah, uh, there's lots more details here in the documentation on how you can work with these uh, zip archives. Um, and the main reason that we did this change in the end, in that we opened up uh, this kind of functionality, is that we believe that it has the potential to greatly simplify your deployment scenarios. So if you have your, your maps, uh, you might have a lot of different maps in different formats uh, stored in some sort of file structure. Uh, I'm sure many of you, you have struggled with how to efficiently transfer all this data to your target systems when it's time to deploy. Uh, of course, maybe previously you've zipped it up yourself and then unzipped it on the target hardware, or you might have used other installation mechanisms to transfer the data. Uh, but now it's as easy as just putting all this data into a zip file and then putting that zip file on the target system. No unzipping required. You just tell the engine to read directly from the archive. It's also a completely platform independent way of distributing your data. It works on both Windows, Linux, and Android. Um, so yeah, uh, we think it's a really good deployment mechanism uh, used right, this zip file support. Okay, uh, I see some, some um, questions <laughs> popping in in the QA panel. Uh, really great, I'll get to them later. Uh, for all of you who are joined here, don't forget to post your questions there if you have any. <laughs> we will get to them in the end, I, I promise. Yeah. Okay, so that brings us to the end of the main new features in 5.15 then. But of course, we did a lot of smaller things as well. As usual, once you've installed 5.15, have a look at the release notes for the full list of changes. Uh, but a few things I wanted to mention in this presentation is that uh, the tile layer component that you use for tiling in 2D maps it can now preload data in zoomed out scale levels, uh, kind of like what the globe view does in the 3D map display. So there's a new preload behavior that you can use to, to configure this. Um, and um, so essentially you turn that on and then uh, if you're zoomed into a certain area and then quickly zoom out, then those zoomed out levels will already be preloaded so that you won't see this usual sort of flickering during the tile loading. Uh, that you could see previously. Uh, on the 3D format side, uh, we added support for uh, an OGC format called 3D tiles. And there's a new mechanism, uh, a new class called the Map Package Model Writer, which allows you to take 3D tiles data, put it in a geo package, and then very efficiently use that uh, in a globe view map. So the 3D tiles format is typically used for high res uh, 3D city models, for example. So you now have an easier way of bringing those into the engine using this format. Um, 
uh, talking about the OGC and the formats that they standardize, uh, we made several improvements to our support for OGC Geo package. Um, primarily, this is driven by uh, a profile that's created by an organization called the DigiWig. DigiWig is the Defense Geospatial Information Working Group. Uh, so they're in the business of um, creating profiles that standardize how uh, data formats and service interfaces are used in a military context. And Kamata Engine now conforms to all these different profiles uh, that are required for DigiWig interoperability. What else? Uh, well, on the nautical side of things, we did a small improvement that uh, we've that's been requested from several of our customers. Uh, you can now on the S52 visualizer, which does the standardized symbology for nautical charts, uh, you can tell it to use our label organizing mechanism to de-conflict the labeling in the nautical chart. So a small but uh, important little new feature there. Also, for those of you who are using the custom data set me mechanism to integrate either proprietary geodata sources or application data, there are two improvements uh, in this uh, API. Um, one improvement is that you can now supply dataset info information. So dataset info is the data discovery mechanism that is included in the engine. Uh, dataset info allows Carmenta Engine to go out on a, on a folder on the file system and find all the data sources that it can read in that folder, for example. And you can now hook into this mechanism using the data set uh, info and custom data set then, uh, which means that also your proprietary data sources um, that's read with a custom data set can be discovered in the same standardized way. So for some scenarios, this will be a very useful uh, addition, I think. Also on the performance side, uh, I think many of you know that we have a caching mechanism on the ordinary layer called the cache mode. Uh, you can use uh, cache mode dynamic or dynamic async to speed up the rendering uh, of application objects by caching them on the graphics card. Previously, you could only use uh, this cache mode with so-called memory data set uh, data sets. Um, so that, that is uh, uh, feature containers which are sort of owned by Carmenta Engine. But you can now use the caching mechanism also if your application data is provided via a custom data set. So from a performance perspective, this uh, means that custom data sets are now on equal footing with memory data sets once again. Uh, so I think that's also uh, makes for new possibilities to use custom data sets also in a high performance scenario. Yeah. Okay, so that's, that's it uh, on the 515 front then. Now I think I find, I'm finally at the end of that part of the presentation. Uh, so yeah, we really did a lot of different things. We're, we're really proud about this release. Uh, I hope you found uh, things that sounded interesting in the, in the presentation. And uh, as I said, don't uh, forget the QA panel and uh, you're, feel free to, to reach out after the webinar as well if you want a one-on-one -on -one discussion on any of the new features. But I promised that I would also give you a little sneak peek on uh, what's uh, upcoming in our product suite, didn't I? So uh, let's move on to that. Oh no, I, I actually, I forgot one slide. <laughs> what do you know? Um, just a few words on the system requirements then before we get into the roadmap. Um, so what we did in 5.15 is that we started testing on Windows 11. Uh, I don't know if any of you guys are on Windows 11 already, but uh, if you have plans to upgrade, then uh, you can be sure that Carmenta Engine will work there as well. Uh, we also, as we had previously advertised, uh, we removed support for the older Windows 7 and Windows 8 operating systems. Those are no longer officially supported. If you want a Carmenta Engine version that is officially supported on these operating systems, then you have to stay on version 5.14 then. And 5.14 is still fully supported, I should add. So we're not abandoning Windows 7 and Windows 8 users. We're just saying you can't upgrade to the latest and greatest anymore. Uh, and of course, we are tying this and we are uh, trying to sync this with, with you guys. So I don't believe that we have any ongoing development on, on this uh, these operating systems. Um, uh, and of course, uh, Microsoft is now also no longer supporting Windows 7 and Windows 8. So that's also part of the thinking that went into this discussion on dropping the support. On the Android side, we have dropped support for 
ARM CPUs, which are 32 bits. Uh, so now the, the Android version, it supports 64-bit uh, Intel architectures and 64-bit ARM architectures. Um, again, if you still need to deploy on 32-bit ARM, then you can stay on Endian 5.14 then, which is fully supported. So that's it for 5.15. <laughs> now on to the roadmap then. Yeah, we still have some time for that. Good. I haven't uh, talked too much then. Uh, yeah, and I see uh, some additional questions popping in there. Great. Keep it up, guys. Um, so roadmap. Well, one of the big new things that we're uh, focusing on uh, in our development right now is uh, our support for cross-platform development. This is something that we hear a lot about from you guys. Uh, it's becoming more and more interesting to have a single code base and be able to deploy to different uh, targets. Uh, and of course, uh, we wanna support this as well as we can. We wanna make it easy for you to do that kind of development with Carmenta End. Uh, and for us, this means a lot of different things actually. So there are a lot of different uh, work being carried out right now that will contribute to our uh, cross-platform development support. Uh, one thing we're doing, is that we are combining our SDK so that we will have one combined SDK that supports both Windows, Linux, and Android development. Um, so if you install this SDK on Windows, for example, you'll get the uh, binaries that are needed to run on Linux. Of course, we will be fully supporting the WSL, the Windows subsystem for Linux, which is Microsoft's sort of a preferred way of letting you do Windows development also on a Windows, uh, Linux development also on a Windows PC. Um, so uh, one use case for this is, for example, that you'll install the Windows SDK and then you'll develop some sort of microservices that you want to deploy on uh, Linux-based Docker containers, for example. That will now be much more straightforward when we add this support. Um, so the SDK packaging is one uh, thing. Um, Another piece of the puzzle here is that we're extending our support for C++ development so that you can also do C++ development on Android. Uh, and this is also something that you've requested a lot. I, I know that you know, C++ devs using Qt Quick as the UI framework. Uh, well, Qt Quick is a really modern UI framework with great cross-platform support. So I, I really think that doing C++ Qt Quick development is today one of the best ways of of doing cross-platform cross development of UI apps. And uh, of course, then you wanna do that on Android as well. Uh, so once we add this piece of the puzzle, you'll be able to have one code base, one C++ Qt Quick UI, and deploy it to both Windows, Linux, and Android seamlessly, right? Uh, but of course, uh, a lot of you are also using .NET to do development. Uh, and of Microsoft is doing a lot of work to the .NET framework as well. Uh, to make it suitable for cross-platform development, as I'm sure you know. Uh, and we're trying to keep on top of that as well and um, improve our SDK to support all those different scenarios. Uh, right now, that means uh, extending our support for .NET 6. Uh, I, I should add that it's also already perfectly possible to use Carmenta Engine in a .NET 6 application, but uh, we plan to make that more of the default uh, going forward. Uh, also, as you might know, Microsoft uh, is in the process of creating a new UI framework for .NET called MAUI. Um, we plan to support MAUI fully as well for both uh, Windows and Android development. So that will then be another way of doing cross-platform things, but this time using the .NET platform. Uh, so these are three of the things that are connected to our uh, cross-platform push here. And this is something that will uh, show up in, in upcoming versions of Carmenta Engine. Again, we are really interested to hear about your use cases here. If you are thinking about ways to do cross-platform development, please let us know so that we can ensure that our product suite sort of keeps up with how you want to do things. Uh, we really, really don't want to lock you in. We, we don't want to force you to work in a special way when, when using the engine. We want to be as open as possible here. That's, uh, that's our strategy also going forward. Okay, uh, some other things on the roadmap, on the visualization side of things. Um, we are adding support for something we call map elements. 
So map elements is a new uh, sort of concept that more or less replaces the old screen layer concept. Uh, screen layer gave you a way to draw things on the map, which was uh, fixed in position relative to the map. So it stayed on the screen, even when you zoomed and tabbed. Um, so that gave you a way to draw things like a scale bar, for example. But it required some application code to do that. But what we're doing now is that we're adding predefined elements, which makes it so much easier to do these kind of things. So there will be predefined map elements for scale bars, for example, for uh, compass roses or north arrows, for um, adding attribution texts to your map. And you will, of course, be able to implement your own map elements that uh, draw other kind of things on top of the map. So it's a small thing, uh, but we think that it can uh, greatly simplify how you implement uh, certain very common uh, use cases in your application. So what else do we do? Uh, well, uh, as usual, we have ongoing work on improving our sets of analyses. Uh, right now, we have essentially two focus areas for our analysis. Uh, one is that we are opening up our visibility analysis by making it possible for you to pass in your custom propagation implementation into our visibility analysis. So as you know, our visibility analysis, as it is today, it works with line of sight. Uh, so it calculates uh, based on a straight line between uh, observer and target, wh whether you have intervisibility. But we know that a lot of you, you are doing other things with the engine. Uh, you want to integrate other kind of propagation models. Uh, radio coverage is uh, one good example of this, where you typically take into account both the elevation and the terrain types along the line from the observer and the target. Um, another good example is that you might want a different trajectory than a straight line, uh, for example, a ballistic trajectory. Um, that's also something that we'll be able to integrate uh, using this uh, functionality. Uh, of course, this is also something that you have been able to do before, but it's required quite a lot of application code and quite a lot of APIs called to command to Andean uh, to do uh, custom propagation calculations. So by opening this up and making it a part of our built-in coverage analysis, we think that it will be much easier for you guys to integrate your calculations. Another thing where we're looking at improving existing analysis is that we're extending our terrain routing, the functionality that allows you to find a good path in a terrain for an off-road vehicle. We're extending that functionality so that it can also calculate suitable routes in the air. And the route in the air might, for example, need to avoid a restrictive airspace. Uh, it might need to take into account uh, performance characteristics of the, the aircraft, such as a maximum climb rate and so on. Um, so essentially the use case we are looking at here uh, is to make it possible for you to use this routing functionality also to find routes for drones or UAVs. Um, so this is an area where we also, we have a lot of ongoing projects in this area. We're helping uh, customers like you implement this kind of functionality. And we want the underlying engine to support this use case uh, even better in the future. So uh, improved uh, routing calculations also for air routing. That's uh, another thing that's uh, on the roadmap for the engine. Okay, that's what I wanted to say about <laughs> the ongoing development. Of course, uh, we are doing a lot of other things at the moment. Uh, development of the next version of Carmenta engine is, is uh, Going, moving ahead at full steam at the moment, uh, but these are the most important things that we, we are working on. So we, we very much welcome your feedback on, on this functionality. Uh, if there's something that you think, think might be of use for you guys, then do get in touch so that we can ensure that we, we meet your requirements with the implementation. So uh, time for a little Q&A then. Uh, yep, uh, there's been questions I see, great. Uh, they're, they're popping up on my other screen over here. So let's see. Yep, uh, we have a question about the grip support. Um, so the question is uh, which formats, which versions of the grip format that we support? And I don't have a full uh, detail on this. Of course, that's in the documentation, but I do know that we support both grip one and grip two data sources. 
Uh, I know that we also support JPEG 2000 and coded raster data inside the grid files. Uh, so we've been trying this out with data from a lot of different providers and uh, we've tried to make the support as exhaustive as possible, essentially. Um, okay, other questions? Yes, questions about the, the zip file support. Um, so the question is, what's the performance difference, essentially? Uh, uh, is there a difference in performance when reading from a zip file rather than uh, reading directly from a file system? And the answer is uh, no. Um, as long as the zip file is not using compression, so the zip file should be using uh, the so-called store compression, which just packages the data and doesn't further compress it. Um, and then there is no performance difference. Uh, we are just uh, opening the zip file and then we are indexing inside the zip file in the same way as we would uh, sort of index the, or, or access files directly in the file system. Um, so uh, no performance difference. Um, in some scenarios, performance might actually be slightly better than reading from a file system. Yeah. Uh, what else? Okay, so yeah, regarding the uh, visibility analysis. Uh, so the question is if the... Okay, so the question is if, if we support multiple such areas. Okay, so I showed you in the demo, uh, I showed you that I defined a target area and, and observer area. Uh, the question is if we support multiple such areas and also if they can have holes in them. And the answer is yes and yes, essentially. You can use any sort of polygon geometry to define these, including such with holes. And you can also have multiple target areas and then figure out where the best position is to observe any of these uh, target areas. Yep. Okay. Yes. And then another question around the performance for the zip file, which I already answered. So yeah, I think essentially that brought me to the end of the questions. Uh, so uh, then it's not much more for me to do than to, to wrap up the webinar, I suppose. If you think that you asked a question that I didn't answer, then feel free to get back afterwards. And uh, as I said, uh, the recorded webinar will be posted on our social media, so you will be able to, to look at it uh, afterwards as well. Right.